So, um, by popular request, John Burgoyne has yep. agreed to come back to the Sears. He's spoken to us a couple of times before, and he's still working enjoyed it. In yep. management school, aren't and, you? And every year I become more one of you. <laughs> We're waiting for you with open arms. <laughs> I'm, six, I'm 67. Anybody younger than me? Younger than you. Oh, younger yeah, than yeah, me. Yeah, younger than you. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, one of you already. Yeah. So when, when I put this, this occasion into my iPhone, he's got this predictive spelling. So he called you older leathers. <laughs> <laughs> Which is better than the other one it sometimes does when I put learning in, which is Lira's. <laughs> <laughs> we could spend the whole hour on jokes if you yeah, like. Yeah, we could. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my topic is, has leadership reached its sell-by date? And is there a new route to salvation of the state? Some of you will have been managers, leaders in your professional careers, is that right? Yes. And I don't know whether you've followed leadership. So the, first, the argument is in two parts. Um, in the first part, I'm going to argue that leadership, which has probably been popular for about 15, 20 years, I mean, it's always been around, but in a high profile way, is reaching itself by now at the end of a, a run for, for reasons why. I'm also going to argue that it, um, it's got what is leadership, in one of its current forms, is what got us into trouble with the credit crunch. I'll speculate, I mean, it's not going to go away, but um, I'll speculate about how it might change or what might come afterwards. And the second part has got more of an ecological flavour, and I know um, Transition City Lancaster. In fact, we have one um, girl, Capstick, is she been with you? Oh, yes. Yeah, she did our MA in um, Leadership and Sustainability, graduated yes. very recently. Yeah. I, know, I know about that lot. Um, but the, the eco-link, um, and this is just a, a pre-run of the argument, is that depending on how we play it, um, uh, if we continue I mean, politicians have really assumed that the economy has got to grow. Um, and in one sense, there must be limits to that, at least that part of the economy that depends on material resources. Um, but if we can go into the knowledge economy and beyond into what I call spiroculture, which is about meaningful, creating meaningfulness, um, uh, we might have a, we, have, we can have a form of prosperity uh, that's less economically damaging. It's said that the, the poor walk, walk lightly on the earth, you heard that one? Yes. Um, and you'll all know the Maslow hierarchy, do you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, which many people criticise, and I, I would agree with them. I agree. I, it's, I think it, it rings a lot of bells with people, but I, I don't think it's ultimately a hardwired psychological truth. It's more a deeply seated sort of social convention, particularly American and Western. So the notion that you can't self actualise unless you've got a full stomach and you know where your next meal and meals, where is the future are coming from. Whereas your Zen Buddhists can live on a bowl full of rice and, and meditate and self-actualize with a minimum degree of, of that. Now, so I think if we can collectively go that way, and of course it's interesting that the um, countries with those um, Eastern religions which are more oriented that way are rapidly westernizing. Mm. So it's sort of touch and go, isn't it? They'll still be close to their spiritual roots, I imagine. Um, whether America is a spiritual country is up for debate. Uh, I, because, I mean, because of the Bible Belt, I was having an argument just before Christmas with somebody <coughs> claiming it was. And then an email came round saying that um, Obama and the White House stopped calling the Christmas tree a Christmas tree and were calling it a holiday tree. OK, right, the end of leadership. Well, as I said, I think it's had a 15, 20 year uh, run. Anybody followed the, you know, the leadership fad? I mean, the papers are full of it. Yeah. I've just. Um, exchanging emails with the editor of the Oxford University Press this morning. And, and when I looked at it recently, there's at least 40,000 books on leadership on Amazon. Only about a half a dozen on followership. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> but the, ed the editor, is, and he's asking me to review another book by chap who I'll mention later. Um, and he says there seems to be an insatiable desire, you know, appetite for books on leadership. Amazing though it is. Um, so I'm saying, I'm going to argue it's coming to its end as a high profile thing. It will exist, it did exist before. And in fact, as I'll say, I think probably, uh, well, I'll say it now. Uh, <coughs> do you know when management came in? It was the time you started the car factories, wasn't it? I forget the name. Well, that's, that's closer. I mean, look, there's always been management and leadership as an activity, but the actual term in its modern day sense 
we came in with the industrial revolution with manufacturing and in fact just down the road in Manchester with the cotton mills and that and what happened was that the um, owner of the cotton mill who was almost never to be a bloke um, built his cotton mill got it up and running then he either wanted to go and start a second cotton mill or go and build a country house in Cheshire and take up hunting shooting and fishing <coughs> um, uh, and in either case he appointed somebody called a managing agent to run the factory it is set up. So that's the origin of the word. Um, and that, so that would be, what, mid-19th century, early 19th century industrial revolution. And indeed, one of the earliest management courses was at Cambridge, and that was for ex exactly for the probably second or third sons of uh, the landed gentry who were well, going to end up doing that. I gave a talk a few weeks ago on um, uh, Furness Abbey, and uh, there, there were actually mentions in the um, in the writing of it before the dissolution, the dissolution of the monasteries, when they were doing the survey, they mentioned the managers that they have be out in different places. Well, oh, okay. The various states, yeah. I mean, um, that, that, it would be interesting if that, that was what they were calling them now. No, eight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. And the word, and then the, the word management itself no. is broadly believed to have come from two sources. There's a French word uh, called manager for housework an Italian word, managiore, um, for, for, mani for managing war horses in, in, in the Italian army. Uh, and a friend of mine, David Weir, in the place where I could deliver this talk, says there's an, Arab, an Arabic sort of base, more closer to the Italian uh, pattern of meaning. Um, and yeah, so but before then, books, we you know, Machiavelli and the Prince and or, and and the, the weren't corporations as we know them today, but the organisations were the, the church and the state and the military, basically. Sometimes I talk to audiences who haven't heard of Parkinson's Law, but I bet I'm on a safer ground here. Do you remember Parkinson's Law? You remember what it was, the main one? Work expands to fill the time, time allotted, which is still true today. But it's had a number of sub, you know, sub clauses or sub uh, laws or whatever you call them. Uh, and one was that uh, when an activity moves from the kind of um, porter cabin on the edge of the um, industrial estate to a new, new central building, then it's kind of beginning to, it's approaching its sort of sell-by date. Mm -hmm. And what is the down there? A ten million pound sort of tin hut called yeah. the Lancaster Leadership Centre. Uh, a very nice tin hut, but that's what it is in the sense it's got steel structure and steel cladding on the outside. Um, <laughs> and so that's where you get the 10 million these days. Um, so that, yeah, that sort of fits that view. And they're all over the place. Um, leadership centres, at least in the public sector, have been institutionalised just about, you know, um, police, army, obviously, um, uh, health, education, um, local government. And indeed, I went to the launch a number of years ago when Gordon Brown was still the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer. And he came to that launch, it was in central London, of the Leadership Foundation of Higher Education, that's the one for um, universities. Uh, and he was actually quite witty close up. Uh, and he said, well, there's a leadership centre for everything. And he paused and said, except senior political leaders. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that was a dig at, um, at Tony Blair, uh, who actually, when I think about it, is a classic case of what I'm going to say about leadership at the moment. Because he was all kind of, I'm out there, I'm international, I'm abroad. I'm a broad vision person, and he was very you know, bad on local politics and the more the, on the kind of what I'll call the analytics. Uh, you remember all the um, uh, weapons of mass destruction data, which he, which may have been ambiguous, but he ignored it or spun it his own way. Uh, there's a guy called Keith Grint who used to work here, um, who's, who says there's a pendulum that swings between management science, that's the analytic side, and, and human relations. Uh, that's the kind of people soft side of things. And leadership is clearly on the soft human relations side. Um, and I think that that means a lot of true. The, um, some of you, many of you will know the total equality movement, which is one of the great sort of survivors in terms of organizational change recipes. And I think one of the reasons why it survives is that it's got both. So it's got statistical process control for the science and sort of Kaizen and quality circles. And that's, so it's actually, it's got both sides of the pendulum swim. Uh, uh,
in, in the health service where I do a lot of research, particularly evaluating leadership development program, <coughs> they've run down, not entirely eliminated leadership development, but in terms of things like system improvement and particularly something called Six Sigma, <coughs> which is part of the um, TQM tradition. <coughs> um, <coughs> and it's about taking local um, patient pathways and tightening them up, you know, so the, the blood sample to the lab and back again and all the rest of it, spotting those things and, and improving them. <coughs> and, and no harm in that. And it's quicker to do, probably in some ways cheaper, uh, kicks in its effect more quickly, and it's easy to evaluate and prove that it's value for money. So I think there's that kind of swing I've seen in the NHS and I think probably elsewhere. We had a student who researched the consultancy market, the kind of the soft side, the human relations side in Grint's terms was going down, but the, the, the more hard management science, the analytic stuff is holding up. And I think PricewaterhouseCoopers has invested several million pounds in a new sort of analytics center to sell that stuff. <coughs> um, so I think it's already happening. Leadership um, has caused the credit crunch. This is um, one of my uh, strong parts of the argument, well, I hope, um, strong in what it asserts anyway. And that is that um, we got into the credit crunch because leaders were all into the mission, vision, empowerment stuff, the human, <coughs> the soft side of it, and they were ignoring the analytics because the problem in the credit crunch was largely those subprime mortgages, which had, um, like, they were about like, like boxes of apples with rotten apples in, um, and the, and the um, dud mortgages were the rotten apples, which infected the rest and meant, meant the whole boxes weren't worth anything like what people have previously thought they had. Um, and that, so the, the soft leadership, my argument is. Uh, in, in the NHS, where I've done a lot of work, any, any of you worked in the NHS? Um, uh, I, I did a lot of work on leadership, um, evaluation of leadership development programs. Uh, and a, a few years ago, they started running that down in favor of what they call system improvement projects. That's kind of taking a bit of the, um, the chain, like, uh, when blood tests go off to the lab and come back and look at that and sort of improve it, tighten it up, speed it up, make it more economical and effective and so on. So that's an example of that. And they're more local, they're easier to evaluate, they're quicker to have an impact. So as opposed to leadership, which would at best take years to, um, to have an effect and the causal link is always difficult to establish. So that's an example of Keith Grint's pendulum swinging in my view and a lots of a student of ours researched the consultancy market and found that the consultancy market for the hard stuff, system improvement, is holding up, whereas the soft stuff, leadership, team building, blah, 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 culture change, has faded away quite substantially. So I think it's, um, it's happening. Um, there's quite a lot of fuss about something called lead distributed leadership. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it, uh, it doesn't, but that's one possibility about where's leadership going. Now, I'm working on a course that's been jointly run by two organisations and uh, their senior management and their cold face workers and it's struggling to recruit because that's because they just haven't got their act together so that that's leadership, distributed leadership not working but I think other situations Could you are. just define uh, well leadership sorry um, <coughs> distributed leadership is one of the things that's called well the opposite of heroic leadership um, so if you go to I mean I don't know this group is probably has a degree of distributed leadership, but one or two people like yourself, Janet, yeah, kind of. Six of us run it between us. Six yeah. of yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's probably distributed leadership in yeah. the, and then some sharing with the, the larger community that yeah. you work with. So you're yeah. probably and my colleague David Collins has talked about something called blended leadership, which might describe it too. Which you 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 have some of each. So um and this this he was researching in further education, but I'm sure it's true in higher education too. So lecturers and the like like the freedom of distributed leadership, the empowerment and autonomy, but they like somebody to tell them where the goalposts are. So it's a kind of mix of the two, and I think that's quite a good idea. Um, virtual leadership, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, <coughs> um, is um, that, um, uh, that's work leadership other than face to face, you know, uh, through any, some kind of electronic uh, remote communication. And often of, of remote, so there's a whole shift towards virtual work, uh, virtual teams. So, for example, many years ago, 
I studied in a research uh, set up at Abingdon Oxford to belong to Exxon, SO. And there they would, if they had a research project, they'd fly in people from all over the world, move their families, pay for their children's private school fees, their health insurance, their golf club memberships. Very expensive thing. Nowadays, uh, they leave them where they are. They'll fly together for, you know, for a couple of days for a meeting. And the rest of the time they will work or they're on video conference, video phones, Skype, conference spaces, email, you name it, the whole caboodle. Um, and, uh, and of course education is virtualizing more, more of that alongside it. And that's, that's, that's virtuality. And there's something in education is something called correspondence theory, um, which says educational practice mirrors economic, social, cultural conditions. So in the classic Victorian schoolroom, rows of desks, teacher at the front, is exactly like the clerk working offices, rows of supervisor at the front, or this kind of shop floor equivalent. <coughs> and so today, so as, as um, um, work becomes more virtual, so perhaps learning becomes, teaching and other things become more virtual, <coughs> and including leadership. Um, uh, of course, there's a question about what chicken and the egg, and although probably in education, we probably like to think that we, we lead these things. In fact, it's the other way, probably the other way around. Uh, social practices change, so the Industrial Revolution created the need for clerks, and the schoolroom adapted to supply the labour market that wanted that kind of thing. So sadly, it may be that, that way around, <coughs> unless we reverse the tables to our research and action research and so on. Um, no, I don't know whether you're, how much you're getting into virtual education, are you? Virtual distance learning? Anyway, it's, it's certainly something to think about uh, for the future. We have been at Lancaster, but still, still a blended rather than a, <coughs> a continuous one. But I've researched action learning, and there are people who do it nothing but. Um, and some, some do it in a very low-tech way, and some people do it in a high-tech way. And they usually do it in, it's about three to one in favor of low-tech. So email exchanges and telephone conferences. And at the other exchange, you've got Second Life. I gather Second Life campuses, except Second Life is full of university campuses. Um, <coughs> and there's been a growth curve. And they replicate university campuses all too well in the sense that you can't find any staff when you want to. <laughs> um, uh, there are three, I mean, three tests for kind of virtual organization. One is where a lot of us spend most of their time as a kind of keyboard screen interface. And if you're doing that, you can do it in the office, open plan, at home, in a hotel, on a train, in a Starbucks coffee bar, you know, it doesn't matter where you are. Um, uh, then if uh, organizations have a lot of shared databases um, and everybody can tap into it for wherever they are, that's it. And the last, the last dimension, which I think you will recognize, would be exemplified by, say, Amazon Bookshop, yeah? yeah. So they, they will um, obviously serve us as customers entirely virtually. Obviously they have. In fact, I think there's one, the UK one is somewhere you passed on the M6, M40, M42, one of my regular ids, can't remember quite where. So obviously they have a physicality, uh, but they, they will post off their books and you'll order them online. And I've no doubt they um, get them from uh, their suppliers. So I work with Lego UK, which is entirely distribution. And at that time, shops, um, toy selling was moving from the corner, to corner shop, which was serviced again by probably by a chap in driving a Ford Cortina with a trilby hat <laughs> and a clipboard, you know, taking the orders to places like Toys R Us, to your toy supermarkets. Yeah. Um, and there they do a deal. They say, you'll stock these um, items, you'll display them here, which is a critical thing, where your goods are displayed in a supermarket makes a big difference. <coughs> and we'll have this sliding scale of price, volume and price, and um, then they plug their just, their, 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 the Toys R Us tills will record what's sold, they plug that data into the um, Lego computer, and they automatically restock, um, and so on and so forth, and the invoices go out, so that's virtual, you know, the kind of uh, organisation supplier end as well as the customer end. So there you have it. Now virtual leadership. Um, there's a woman called Susanna Zuboff at Harvard Business School. You can't get anywhere in Academica if your name's John Smith. You've got an exotic name. Mine's just about okay. Um, um, 
the first thing we do with IT is automate things, you know, put the payroll on the computer and, and all that other wonderful stuff. But next, she talks about informating when you saturate organizations with internal uh, <coughs> visibility, one of my dimensions of virtual work. And she said that's, a very, that's an entirely different use of IT. So whether, um, uh <coughs> whether um, leadership will change its nature because of that is an interesting question, but it, it might well do. And it might change education, and perhaps is changing education as it, as it moves, from, uh, moves to um, <coughs> particularly Web 2 type stuff where it's much more interactive. So um, we had uh, Hugh Wilmer at Lancaster a few weeks ago giving a rather depressing seminar on uh, the research excellence framework and the research. And, and he was kind of very negative about the effect of the whole thing. But he couldn't see an alternative. But my t take is, um, in some sense, the campus is losing its grip on education and knowledge production. So if you take something like Wikipedia, which some people criticize, but often it gets it right. And there's a kind of form of peer review in there. I haven't done it, but I would imagine that the kind of the entries in Wikipedia are no, no more a quarter or a third by academics and the rest by other people. <coughs> and it's got its form of peer review and occasionally it makes mistakes, <coughs> but don't we all? But largely, and I think sort of knowledge production is getting more distributed that way and leadership may be getting more distributed that way. Now in terms of virtual leadership, I think we're, we're in the automating stage of leadership. So the same leadership, it's the same, leadership is the same activity and process. It's just a different medium at the moment. But sometime in the foreseeable future, I think we'll find new forms of leadership that emerge, um, emerge with that. Um, <coughs> virtuous leadership, just to play on words. Um, <coughs> obviously, there'll be lots of leadership scandals happening, you know, Enron before and afterwards, you know, after Guinness and so on. So there's quite a lot about the kind of moral aspect of leadership. Um, because you can say, when you talk about effective leadership, I mean, you can make quite a good argument that Hitler was a very good leader for quite a long time in the effectiveness sense, which is totally different from the kind of <coughs> moral sense about, you know, what, what's a good thing. Um, uh, <coughs> and um, <coughs> Churchill was a <coughs> heroic leader as well, um, but he had his nasty side. Um, <coughs> did you know he, from Bletchley Park, I've just read the history of Bletchley Park, the um, Enigma Code place, and apparently Britain knew that Japan, Japan was going to bomb at Pearl Harbor. But Churchill said, don't tell the Americans, because we want that to happen, so we'll bring them into the war. Now, war's a nasty business, but uh, <coughs> so maybe, maybe that was one of the bigger scene of things. Um, <coughs> that was the right thing to do, but it's a hell of a moral choice, isn't it, after me? And ephemerized leadership, is, ephemerized uh, means you're know, doing doing the same with less. So the Chuck, American Chuck called Buckminster Fuller coined the phrase. So if you think of um, your parents or grandparents, radio would be a big chunky thing with a big battery and a little battery outside it. Remember those? Mm -hmm. And now you can get a little radio the size of your watch that um, forms better and uses much less power and so on. So that's ephemeralization. So it's happening to organizations and arguably it, it might happen to so it's both leadership of ephemeralization, which is like lean, but also ephemeralized leadership doing leadership itself. And it says there is research that shows that um, at plant level, more efficient plants have less but better managers and leaders. Uh, because when you have too many mediocre managers, uh, all they do is arrange meetings with each other and waste a lot of time. <laughs> if you're in doubt, call a meeting, you know. Uh, so you, you need less better managers and leaders from that point of view. And I, I'm a great fan of something called follow, follow, followership and the law of the situation. This is an American lady called Mary Parker Follett, who <coughs> was long forgotten. I think she was writing back in the 40s and 50s, uh, but has been um, <coughs> fortunately rediscovered. And that fits very much with what you're saying. Um, <coughs> if you, it's the situation that tells you what to do. But, and it's the people at the coalface that get the news first, but they're spread out. So there's nothing wrong with hierarchy, as long as your senior leaders listen to them, see the big picture, feed that back to people, and help them find a direction through it. And that process describes a learning organization cycle, which I'm very interested in too. Um, so as I said, partly of this is, is, is back to um, management science. 
not <coughs> not discarding. It's a bit like the uh, the machine and the oil. You need both. You know, a, a machine without oil is going to seize up. What oil with no machine to lubricate isn't going to to do anything. So a bit of a, a corrective move, let's call it. 